Hi, this is Dr. Fritz Mora. Today we're going to be preparing tooth number 30 for a monolithic lithium disilicate crown with a design of a modified shoulder for the finish line, two millimeter reduction for the non-functional cusp, the central groove, the functional cusp, and the functional cusp bevel. Let's begin by reviewing the viewpoints we will take during preparation. The buccal view is achieved by rotating the patient's head to the left. The occlusal and TOC views are achieved with the patient looking straight forward, the lingual view is achieved by rotating the patient's head to the right. Note that a mirror is not required for any of these views. Before preparation can begin, a putty reduction guide is fabricated. It is essential to put a small amount of putty on the occlusal surface during fabrication. This prevents air bubbles from being trapped and allows accurate recording of the occlusal anatomy. Sharp and well-defined occlusal anatomy is seen here. Note the relatively blunted anatomy on tooth number 31. Trim your putty closely to avoid gingival interference when seating the putty. Take your time when cutting the putty to be accurate. The preparation for the work is the work. Ensure that your cuts are through the center of the deepest part of the occlusal anatomy. If they are not, make a new putty. Ensure a perfect fit on the tooth before proceeding. If the fit is not perfect, make a new putty. We will now begin preparation from the buccal view. Using a finger rest on each hand, use your left hand to support the handpiece. We begin with our buccal axial reduction at the level of the finish line. Attempt to place the finish line in the correct location as your initial cut will be your most stable cut. It is much more difficult to adjust a bad finish line than it is to place a correct finish line. Replaying the previous clip, note the instability of the handpiece. This was due to the incorrect rotation direction of the burr. When cleaving large portions of tooth structure, the burr should be rotating against the direction you are moving the handpiece. In this case, the burr was rotating to the right, but should have been rotating to the left. With the rotation direction corrected, we can now appreciate a much more stable handling of the burr and the handpiece. Next, we will proceed with the interproximal separation. My preferred technique is to move straight through the interproximal contact area using a thin burr, leaving a thin shell of enamel or tooth structure to protect the adjacent tooth. It is very important to lift the burr intermittently while performing this interproximal separation to allow water irrigation to flow in. It is extremely critical to be patient here. Do not rush and do not grow impatient, especially as you finish this cut. The thin shields of tooth structure are then removed with a small instrument. Continuing with the modified shoulder burr, check the interproximal area to see how much clearance you have and reduce axially accordingly. Continue cautiously and patiently and again do not rush. You may borrow the angulation of your mesial and apply it to your distal, but ensure that you're still clearing that adjacent tooth and not abrading it. That's good because I thought it was actually too low. You can rotate the handpiece as shown to approach from the anterior if you're having trouble reaching the distal, but again, support with your left hand. Moving on to our lingual view, we'll complete the axial reduction. We can compare the axial surface with the adjacent teeth and begin cutting. Note the significantly improved stability now that the burr is rotating in the correct direction, in this case, to the right. Using this lingual direct view, you can prepare all the way around the distal lingual line angle. Always check your circumferential axial reduction from the occlusal view. We'll be returning for those sharp line angles. For the next phase, we'll be placing depth grooves on the highest and deepest points of the occlusal surface. In this case, all depth grooves will be two millimeters deep, and we'll keep in mind that the tip of our handpiece is one millimeter in diameter. Once again, we want to move the handpiece in and out intermittently to allow for efficient cutting. View your depth grooves with a mirror. Today, I'll be using a perioprobe with half millimeter markings. 
Here we can see a reduction of 1.5 millimeters. At the buckle groove, 1.5, or even 1 considering the contour of the surface, 1.5 millimeters and 1.5 millimeters. We increase the depth of our grooves accordingly to get as close as possible before moving on. We'll repeat the same steps on the functional cusp and the non-functional cusp, placing depth grooves at the highest points of the occlusal surface and also at the deepest points of the grooves. Since the most common clinician error is under reduction of the tooth, we want to take our time with this part. Here we see two millimeters. We are under reduced at the lingual groove and between 1.5 and two. I went through and adjusted the depth of the depth grooves and verified before proceeding. Here I mark the deepest point of the depth grooves with a pencil so that during smoothing, I can tell as I reach the depth of those depth grooves. Here I'll add even a little more depth to the buckle groove because I notice that my anatomy is a little flat. I notice the reduction on the lingual aspect is lacking and I add a bevel. We'll switch to the red diamond burr to smooth the prep now that the rough preparation is complete. All smoothing is done at a slow speed between 20 and 60,000 RPM. And contrary to when we were reducing a bulk of tooth structure, we will now be moving the handpiece rolling with the burr, with the direction the burr wants to roll. At this point, I noticed that during our rough preparation, the gingiva had climbed up the tooth surface, and so the finish line on the buckle has to be reduced. To refine and lower this finish line, I move methodically from the mesial to distal, I cut only in one direction, from mesial to distal, and lift the burr between each stroke. This is because we've established that the burr cuts differently whether you move the handpiece rolling with the burr or against the burr. We'll carefully refine our finish line such that it is wide enough for the entire tip of the burr to fit, one millimeter. Here we'll round the sharp lingual area. From the occlusal view, we can evaluate our line angles. The mesiolingual and distolingual need further reduction. I use the tip of the burr itself to evaluate the width of the finish line. Here we can see the tip of the burr is not quite fitting. Here we can see the tip of the burr overhangs over the edge of the finish line, indicating the area needing further reduction. The mesial and distal marginal ridge areas need special attention as these are frequently sharp areas. The entire preparation must be smooth to avoid problems with crown thickness due to drill compensation and because sharp areas are crack initiation points for ceramic. We evaluate our crown once again from the occlusal view and are satisfied with the even width of our finish line. Evaluating our reduction, we see two millimeters, two, two, and two. In the center, two, 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 and two. And in the mesial, two, 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 and two. Thank you for watching and please let me know if you have any questions.